Hey now, hey now, hey now. Welcome back to another Mystery Addict video. And I'm your gracious host, Gamma Queen. Now today we're going to be talking about the disturbing portfolio of Harvey Glattman. Before we get into the story, make sure that you like, comment, and subscribe to my YouTube channel. And turn on your post notifications so that you'll know the next time that I upload. Alright. Let's get into the story. Harvey Glattman was born in the Bronx, New York on December 10, 1927 to Ophelia and Albert Glattman, who were part of the Jewish religion. While growing up, Glattman was never considered a normal child due to his many strange actions and interests. When Glattman was younger, he had a hard time connecting with other kids due to him being a bit antisocial. Glattman was not what you consider to be traditionally handsome. He was teased a lot for the fact that he had bad acne and buck teeth, and many kids found him to be strange at the time. But there was a lot more to him than even his parents knew or were prepared for. At the age of 12, his parents started noticing sadomasochistic sexual tendencies due to an incident when they discovered that he had been placing ropes around his neck and pulling it, leaving his neck swollen and red. His mother was very alarmed and took him to a physician who told her that he would eventually grow out of it. But regardless of what he was doing, his mother described her son as a normal, healthy child with a sickness. Eventually, the family moved to Denver, hoping for a new start in a new environment. But Albert's actions just continued and got worse. Glattman's father was not as understanding as his mother and questioned his sexual preferences, believing that his son acted the way that he did, possibly because his sexual preference was men. Life did not get any easier for Glattman when he moved and started junior high. As Glattman got older, he started breaking into homes. For a while in the beginning, he would steal a lot of different things. And in one home, he stole a gun that was in the home. But after some time, he started a pattern where he was breaking into houses of attractive women that he would follow. He would follow them to their homes, and once they were inside, he would enter the home through the window or an unlocked door. After startling the women, he would bound and gag them and sexually molest them. At this point, it was not just harming them that satisfied Glattman. It was the look of fear on their faces and having the power and control that he had over the victim. He was able to get away with what he was doing for a while until one night when he tried to break into the house of a woman named Elma Hammam. While attempting to get through her window, he was approached and apprehended by the police. While being questioned, he immediately confessed to the burglaries but never mentioned the assaults. He was detained for a short period of time and he eventually was released on bail. But him being caught did nothing but ignite his urge to continue what he was doing. While out on bail, he kidnapped a woman named Noreen Laurel and took her to the Sunshine Canyon. Once again, he sexually molested her and then took her back home afterwards. She contacted the police once she reached home Glattman was sentenced to one year in prison for the act, but he was released only eight months later for good behavior. At this time, he was only at the age of 19 years old and still living with his parents. After his release, his mother took him to a psychiatrist. The doctor believed that all of the problems came down to him being scared of women. He suggested that Glattman get involved with activities that would require him to be around women. But his mother thought that it would be best if he were to leave home and go back to New York for a while. She found him a job working at a TV repair shop and also found him an apartment in Yonkers. But moving didn't change the urges that he had. Not long after he moved, he was placed back in prison for an additional two years for robbery. After once again being released from prison, he moved to Los Angeles and opened a TV repair shop. Also during this time, he took on photography as a hobby and took on the name Johnny Glenn as his photographer name and rented a studio of his own. When doing this, it ignited the urges once again. This is when he decided to combine photography and his love of ropes in a deadly career. He began putting out ads for models and he would lure them to his trap 
under the impression that they would be doing freelance gigs. One of his victims was 19-year-old Judy Ann Dahl, who at the time was going through a nasty custody battle after divorcing her husband and found doing pinup modeling would be more lucrative than waiting tables. She agreed to pose for Glattman under the false pretense that she would be fully clothed but tied up shooting for a detective magazine, which was not uncommon at the time. He lured her to his apartment where he bound and gagged her, sexually assaulted her, and took pictures of her. After he assaulted her, he forced her to cuddle with him and watch television. Then he drove her out to east of Los Angeles in the desert and strangled her, taking her life. After Doe never returned home and never called, her roommate tried contacting the number that was left for the photographer. When she called and realized that it was a wrong number, she contacted the police. But sadly, when her body was found, it was enough time where no clues would link back to Glattman. After returning home, Glattman started a collage of photos that he took with the women he tortured and murdered, originally taping the photographs to his wall and then eventually placing all of them in a toolbox for safekeeping. In July of 1958, he discovered a modeling agency called the Diane Studio, where he connected with a model named Lorraine Vigil, who at the time was a first time model and agreed to shoot in his studio. He picked her up and Vigil was excited for her first job. While driving, she tried to engage with Glattman, asking him where was the studio. But Glattman wouldn't respond and he refused to look at her. After a while, Glattman became frustrated with her asking so many questions and pulled the car over on the side of the road. He pulled out a gun and attempted to tie her up, but she fought back and eventually kicked the car door open, causing them to tumble out onto the ground. Harvey continued trying to attack her, but Lorraine was not giving up without a fight and wrestled him in the dirt until she was able to get a hold of the gun herself. By stroke of good luck, a highway patrolman stopped his car when he saw Lorraine pointing a gun at a man on the floor. At first view, he was not sure what was going on, but after telling him what Glattman had attempted to do, and after searching his car and finding bondage and a knife, he realized what had almost taken place. After he was arrested, the police searched his apartment where they found a box full of photographs of women bound and gagged and appearing terrified. When going through the pictures, the police discovered a photo of Judy Dahl and another model that went missing named Ruth McCoddle. After questioning Glattman for a couple of days, he finally confessed to the murders. When confessing, he led the police to the body of Ruth McCoddle and also to the body of a missing woman named Shirley Bridgeford, of whom he met on a blind date. When Glattman went on trial, he pleaded guilty by reason of insanity. He declined a jury trial. When doing so, the judge asked him was he sure, and Glattman replied that he wanted the shortest path to execution as possible. The judge sentenced him to the death penalty, and in September of 1959, he was taken to the gas chambers.